Good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen. I am Yaroslav Kuzminov. I am the Chancellor of the Higher School of Economics and a deputy in the Moscow State Duma. The topic of our today's discussion uh, the social sphere of a modern megacity. We all keep saying that the new economy is an economy of uh, a human being in the social area, which used to be just uh, as uh, an area where remaining money were placed. But to tell it as applied to an area with a little economic activity is one thing, but to say it about uh, a big city is something different. So in the case of Moscow, we are talking about the social sphere of our city as one of its drivers, even from the point of view of future investments and potential uh, incomes. Uh, for example, the people that live in the city. So before we begin our talk, let me introduce you our keynote speaker, Leonid Pechatnikov, Deputy Mayor of Moscow on Social Development in the Government of Moscow, and our invited experts, Rob van der Velde, uh, ex-Vice Mayor of Antwerp for Social Planning, Olivier Bernat, a partner with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, Xavier Emanuele, ex-minister of France on social and humanitarian issues, a well-known uh, person as a founder of the Doctors uh, Without Borders, Miguel Marcarans, uh, the senior vice president of uh, VTB Bank, and Newta Federbesser, the founder of the charity fund Vera, helping hospices. And Svetlana Chupsova is about to join us, the general director of the Agency of Strategic Initiatives. And uh, so our conditions are a little bit tough because after a plenary with the uh, top uh, person, the national leader, it's hard to gather a session, but I think we managed. Yes. Uh, so. If you don't mind, Leonid, we would like to give you 15 minutes, and then we would like to continue with uh, presentations by the speakers. And ideally, we would like to finish with a joint discussion. So, and uh, if speakers are not polite, uh, there will be no questions and answers in that case. As I am a mild person, I asked my colleagues to show you a special poster uh, saying that you have just one minute uh, left. Now, I would like uh, to give the floor to Mr. Leonid Pechetnikov. Okay, uh, do you mind if I speak from here or would you like me to stand up? Well, it depends if you believe uh, you are a serious person sitting here. So, I think then if nobody minds, if nobody su is surprised, let's continue informally from here, because as uh, Yaroslav Kuzminov said, it's not possible to gather uh, a full room of people after uh, the national leader's speech. So let's continue. It's to be an hour, our informal briefing. And I must tell you that any person which uh, runs a social sphere in any city or region, uh, this person uh, continuously ras runs the risks. It's impossible to overcome the risks because it's impossible to cater for the people in areas like healthcare, education. Well, it's close to impossible. It's not possible to find people who would be 100% uh, happy, not only in Moscow, but uh, in 
any uh, rich uh, city of the world. And I hope my colleagues who will speak after me um, will prove that. However, I believe that in recent seven years, there were serious shifts in Moscow's social area. And they have to do with multiple factors. Uh, one of them is the growth of investment in social area. Budget, budget is now spent on social area and it's uh, twice as big as it used to be in 2010. And we managed to reach uh, serious ach achievements. So when we do uh, polling of the population, quite often we hear the question, if you are happy with Moscow healthcare system, and uh, uh, half of the respondents would say, no, we are not happy. And in two or three questions, there is another question. Are you ready to leave Moscow for another city if you are given an apartment, decent salary there? And again, half of the respondent would say no. And when they would be asked about reason, they would say no, because the uh, health care system is good. So the results of the polling were ironical and different social scientists like uh, the higher school of uh, economics uh, represented by Mr. Yaroslav Kuzminov and our institute. So what happened in the social area recently? So this slide shows that the population of Moscow is 12.5 uh, uh, million people who are insured with the territorial uh, foundation of the social security. So uh, have uh, 8.5 percent of the total population of Russia. And for the first time, we reached the expected uh, longevity of nearly uh, 78 years. This is something uh, record-breaking, although in some regions of the North uh, Caucasus, uh, they report better figures. But I have a feeling that, however, our statistics is much, much more reliable. Uh, in order to reach that, uh, the work by social uh, area department is not enough. It's shown that all the departments, 25 departments uh, of the government uh, in Moscow work uh, for the social s s area. And we carry out uh, for national programs. So, and I can probably tell you that uh, um, the average time it takes an ambulance to reach the patients is 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Yeah. It would be totally impossible without development of the transportation networks, new roads, and uh, the separate uh, lane, separate traffic lane, uh, which was really cursed by many, many drivers uh, on the roads. And we achieved a lower mortality. It is uh, one third lower. And the mortality of uh, people in the labor age is the main indicator for how efficient uh, the system the national system of health care is. So here we show that this may be related to the fact that many funds uh, were provided by the mayor and the government as investment. So new jobs were created and the budget of Moscow uh, consists uh, by 50 percent from taxes on individuals, which is an indication that we have uh, lower um, unemployment. And the level of total unemployment went down to 1.3 percent, which is the lowest uh, indicator. We have four times 
uh, more vacant jobs than unemployed people. So on this slide, you see the number of departments and our colleagues uh, are involved in creating accessible environment for disabled people. And I must tell you that we have a lot of uh, houses, old houses with disabled people who live for, on top floors. And thanks to the departments of housing, uh, we tried to arrange uh, over 3,000 uh, hoists uh, and ramps allowing people to reach uh, their apartment. As for apartment, we heard a lot of criticism when we were merging schools in larger educational complexes. So we were told that uh, uh, elite schools were disappearing. But what we actually do, so we tried to uh, level funding, keeping the highest level. So is the highest level in 2010 was 120,000 rubles per pupil. Today it is 160,000 rubles uh, per pupil. And uh, the pupil, the student, is now in the center of the educational system. And the mayor, Mr. Sabanian, covered it in his first presentation. And we could really come to a higher level of education. Very recently, the International uh, Olympic Games on uh, Mathematics. So out of uh, five uh, medals, two were won by Muscovites. We know uh, school 57, school 2, mathematics schools with uh, well-known... No, but this was not the case at this time. 13, 29, uh, recently nobody heard about this school. So it gave two winners of international o Olympic games in mathematics. So we got uh, five gold medals, so which was the result uh, of the United States. They were a little bit uh, better in terms of total score, but India and China were did poorer, and the opportunity to level the educational level in schools so is something we can be proud of instead of uh, regretting it. I don't think that we ever worked so closely with federal structures, including the federal structure, which is called uh, Ross uh, Potrep on Azor, supervising for consumer right uh, supervision. Together with Ross Potrep on Azor, we could uh, establish uh, an efficient system of controlling uh, food products at educational establishments. For the first time, we have a distribution center, and we control the quality of food uh, supplied at schools. And we forgot about uh, the sporadic uh, uh, problems with the in intestinal diseases at schools. So this slide also comments on creating a comfortable and friendly environment. Our mayor said that uh, environment, ecology, was not that important. And creating and creating uh, public spaces is something we can be proud for, uh, given the results of recent five years. Now, I would like to be a little bit more specific, uh, talking about uh, health care. It's closer to my professional background. So, we carried out a very serious reform of Russian healthcare system. So in 2010, we got uh, 120,000 uh, hospital beds, which were not uh, very efficient. And it wasn't the fault of uh, the healthcare professionals, but it uh, happened like that the Moscow healthcare system was technolo technologically 
lagging behind other international systems. So the first goal was to upgrade uh, Moscow healthcare system, and we could do it in two years' time. Then we reorganized it seriously. And one of the recent steps was that we uh, included maternity hospitals and uh, women's center in the structure of uh, uh, multi-purpose centers. And we achieved uh, very good products in, um, in mother's uh, mortality. And when we could provide uh, these services to women and mothers in multi-purpose centers, so we really improved. So we managed to to grow and uh, ensure recovery of 80 percent of uh, uh, newborns with lower uh, weights. So every uh, maternity hospital is now uh, intensive care equipment. So here you see what we do for our little uh, Moscovites. Sadly, the trend for higher birth rate uh, is not in place. For the first time, we are having like the natural laws uh, among our population, which is the trend in all major cities. However, we try to do our best, and it's not about uh, promotion and advertising, but using um, state money, we provide uh, in vitro services for all uh, willing residents. And on this slide, you see that uh, it was not only about the International Olympic Games, but uh, also all Russian Olympic Games uh, show that Moscow um, education is far more advanced than in other regions. Now, have a look at uh, Pearl's international rating showing that graduates of elementary school in Moscow proved to be uh, the most advanced in reading and understanding of text. So Moscow children were ahead of their peers in Europe and America. So on this slide, we're trying to show you what type of schools and hobby clubs exist today. And we approved an unprecedented program art to the kids. So in three years, we will repair all the schools and uh, we will supply to them new uh, musical instruments, uh, which wasn't the case since the collapse of the Soviet year, years. And uh, in three years, we plan to provide all new musical instruments to the schools. As for another program, the next generation in Moscow. So this is the statistics on our fight on unemployment. But it's a little bit like a Canterville ghost. So it exists, but as I said, the number of vacant jobs is much higher than the number of registered unemployed. Uh, because uh, m mainly managers register as unemployed in our country. And our vacant jobs are rather for those who have uh, real life skills. Yeah, so, well, it's not a real manager, but a salesperson. Well, Mr. Yaroslav, well, no, 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 no. A true manager who would uh, uh, register at uh, at vacancy fears would kill uh, his reputation. But we have no uh, doctor or nurse who would uh, uh, go 
Uh, so no, no one uh, registered at the labor registry office. Yes, yeah, so we have some vacant jobs in uh, uh, outpatient uh, clinics. And as I told you, mortality among uh, population of labor age uh, is a serious indication to us. So uh, in my opinion, so the reduction in recent years uh, was um, by one third which would show that uh, uh, recently we are about to reach 80 plus age as mentioned by our president and i must tell you that we managed to considerably reduce uh, fatality from acute uh, cardiac myocard so we created the so-called uh, vascular network what is it? If we have a person uh, with a suspicion for myocardial infarction and we have emergency aid uh, car and uh, who brings uh, our patients to the hospital. This is how it, uh, it was earlier. So they would bring the patients and uh, people at hospital, they did not know what to do with the patients because some of them were booked. Now we have the special system with lights, green lights and uh, uh, red lights. So, so what does it mean? Uh, well, the emergency uh, cars, they take the patients, emergency patients, and they would transport them uh, to the hospital, not to the nearest one, but uh, with vacant places, uh, which uh, has allowed us to decrease uh, intra-hospital lethality from myocardial infarction uh, up to 15 percent. So now we're in line with the developed European countries. Uh, speaking about uh, senior people, uh, you know about our uh, program, uh, Active Long Life. We attract a lot of uh, elderly people and they uh, well, they're active in collaboration with us. They, all, uh, they do not only get treatment, but get enrolled in different clubs, so they do it actively. This is our target, and these are the instruments uh, which will help us to reach this target. I hope we will reach this target in the very near future. But the most important thing is that the longer uh, people live, the more responsible uh, the uh, government uh, and the budget has. So during a long life, people get diseased and they have a lot of disease. So, and they need to be treated. Oncology is one of the most significant issues. Uh, there is a saying that every person will sooner or later uh, have uh, some kind of a cancer, and we need to treat this cancer. So long life is not just being happy. It means being responsible for those people 80 plus. But still, I wish you to live until those uh, 80 plus and to live happily. Thank you for your attention. Leonid, thank you very much. I'm uh, a Moscovite and I am a city deputy. So for me, uh, it's been most uh, pleasant to see those slides and to hear those figures. I'm in charge of a big uh, team of researchers who monitor state health and state uh, education. So uh, be sure, and I know that for sure, that Pichetnikov never exaggerates. So you're still in charge of uh, the big institution of a big city. Big city is not just happiness. It has a lot of challenges, a lot of problems sometimes. That is why, uh, Mr. Pichetnikov, Let's uh, listen to uh, Robo van der Velde. Uh, uh, 
the former mayor of Antwerpen, who will share with us a success story they did uh, in, uh, in the city of Antwerp. After that, probably you will answer my question. But let's listen to uh, Mr. Robo van der Velde first. Before giving a floor to you, I would like to ask a question. So for six years, um, you've been a vice mayor, so you are uh, colleagues with Mr. Pichetnikov, and you were responsible for the program Antwerp City of Tomorrow. Once you've said that the development of the city of today does not mean only urban environment development. But besides uh, hardware, we need to develop the social environment. But the social environment needs some physical facilities, kindergarten, schools, which are most important to attract young professionals if we want to uh, attract them and to keep them. So this is a kind of a circle, so hardware and software. What is uh, primary, what is secondary? This is my first question. Number two question of mine uh, sounds uh, as follows. I love Antwerp, uh, as probably everyone who has ever been there. But this uh, city of 500,000 people, which differs somehow from Moscow. So what do you think could be useful from your experience for Moscow and what not? Okay, thank you for, uh, for your questions. Um, let me let me first say that um, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with, uh, with with the results that uh, that you're showing. Um, when when you ask whether uh, the the hardware goes first or the software, um, well, both go together. Um, what we have experienced is that uh, during a long period, um, let's say from the 70s, 80s, uh, in the um, in the last uh, 100 years and then, and then the last 20 years, we've seen that there was a lot of attention uh, given to, um, to aiding and solving problems. We shifted, we made a paradigm shift um, and saying, well, if, for whom are we building this city and how can we make sure that um, in the city everybody or most likely most people uh, are can be happy and, and, and are good residents and can, uh, can have a good environment um, to, uh, to educate, uh, to be healthy, to be safe. Um, and the path that we have chosen uh, was to have both a good uh, investment in hardware, buildings. Um, we have did that together with the private uh, sector. We've made sure that the shortages that we had in terms of daycare centers, in terms of schools, uh, they were linked to new developments. Um, when we had um, urban design, we asked the investors, the promoters, to pay part of this new um, social infrastructure, um, meaning that you build like 100, 200, 500 apartments, well, then you, you also foresee part of the school, you foresee a daycare center, and you foresee uh, part of the, uh, of the social infrastructure. So both went uh, together. So to be able to cope with the investment, to cope with the pace of growth, um, we made sure that uh, we had uh, the investment. Why can the story of Antwerp uh, also be um, useful to, to Moscow? Antwerp is a pocket metropolis. Um, we, are, um, we are small, but um, we have a number of very big um, areas. We are the third biggest harbor in the world. We have uh, a very strong uh, migration. We have uh, 180 different uh, languages which are spoken in, uh, in our city. Um, this means that we, have, uh, we deal with a lot of social um, uh, issues uh, to integrate, to adapt to, um, to our city, to make sure that uh, we have uh, people uh, who work. 
uh, not only that we have uh, in our city people who come and look for uh, um, uh, for happiness, but they also look for being part of uh, building a city. So I think uh, by doing that and by supporting uh, those uh, investments, it is the same in a in a smaller city than uh, than what you have in a in a mega city. From an investment point of view, it is more difficult in a small city um, because sometimes you lack quantity. Um, and, um, and it can be uh, easier in a, in, a, in a big city. What I wanted to, today to express uh, especially is that when, when you build a city, you have to think for whom are we building it. Um, and in our, um, in our perspective, from a social point of view, there are three, three categories which can be, uh, can, be, can be identified. First of all, families. Um, you need schools, university, we need daycare centers. Um, and it, it is all foreseeable. And what we have seen uh, during the last decades, that is that cities have become, have become more foreseeable. Um, you take uh, the age pyramids, um, you know that the birds of today, they will be uh, in a primary school within six years, they will be in a university in 18 years. So it is practically foreseeable, planable, to uh, make sure that what you do in a city, uh, your investment can be uh, rolled out uh, quite much in advance. A second group um, are the older people. And we see a very vast shift um, from um, the care that we are giving to our older people. Older people. Um, we, had, uh, we had a lot of people that were uh, taken care of in homes, in uh, service flats and, and so on. And we see now that there is a trend to staying longer at home, uh, which we support. That means that one of the most single biggest business in the future will be uh, from a distance to monitor older people's health, to prevent, and also uh, to uh, take care at home. That will be a big growing business in which we invest, um, and then to uh, come to uh, one of your questions, in which we invest also from an infrastructure point of view. What have we done? We have put in place um, a, a site where startups can think about these uh, new technologies. They can start working on apps. They can, um, for, um, they, from the city, they will get the environment and they will develop the programs to make, uh, to make sure that uh, older people can, um, can be monitored from a distance. And then the third group, uh, which will be very important in the future in cities, are migrants. Uh, migrants coming internally and externally. We need to make sure that there is an adaptation. There is an adaptation, there is an integration, uh, especially from a language point of view. Um, there will be a lot of care that needs to be taken for people to integrate into our cities. Um, as our cities keep growing, um, they, must, they must be accessible, but also we must avoid that cities uh, with, within their anonymous, anonymous uh, situation don't become, um, let's say, the big, vast uh, areas of, uh, of migrants. So we need, we need to take care of both sides, one, to, make, to help to integrate, to make sure that they understand the language and that they can work, but on the other hand, avoid that uh, we get in too many. Last but not least, um, I think the um, uh, green space, healthy areas, safe areas in our infrastructure um, are the basis to have a good social infrastructure. We have invested uh, during the last couple of years, like our colleagues in, uh, in Moscow, in squares, in parks, informal contact points in order to make sure that uh, people meet each other again, they talk again, uh, they, can, uh, they can live uh, in, in an environment where uh, they feel at home. And that is, um, I think, from a, from a social point of view, the very first point to start with, 
Um, and that, I think, we have integrated into our uh, planning system, in our urban planning system. I thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, but I still have a short question for uh, Vice Minister Pichetnikov. You know, as I see it, from the point of view of uh, infrastructure, Moscow is the Russian champion because we have a lot of great projects. Uh, we have a lot of uh, medical institutions, cultural in, uh, institutions like theaters, cinemas. Uh, there is one uh, more thing uh, we are still lacking in, universities. There are a lot of universities in Moscow, but not everything is so good there. Uh, it takes uh, on average an hour uh, for a university student to get from their home to the university. Formally, uh, universities are under federal responsibility, not under the responsibility of the city, but it, they are parts of the city still. Can we improve this situation somehow? Uh, so uh, I've heard, uh, just I remember a very good joke of the Soviet time. Probably uh, non-Russian speakers will not understand it, but uh, let, let me try. So there was a parliament delegate who uh, originally lived in some uh, remote place in Siberia. So he went back after the session to his village. He said, uh, you know, uh, my dear friends, I've heard and we all say that everything is for the human. I think that it was in the center of Moscow that I saw that human. That's a joke, certainly. Uh, um, most important thing is that everything we do should be for us, for humans, not for some vague human. Transport, housing, uh, other kinds of facilities are social. I don't think uh, we can uh, well speak about uh, hardware without so software and vice versa. And all this should be human center for the, those humans who should live up to 80 plus and live happily. So we have the structure and it works. And the infrastructure, but we'll face a lot of challenges and even problems. I don't think the major problem is for students uh, to uh, spend one hour uh, to get to the university. I think universities have other problems, and this is the quality education. You know, some students would probably prefer to spend more than one hour, but uh, to the university with a very good education, they will do it. University graduates uh, should be great professionals. This is most important. And you're right. Uh, the, ma the majority of Moscow universities are under federal responsibility of the federal government. But they are really part of our city. As I see it, what has been done here in Moscow in recent years uh, is targeted at making the city human-centered. And the center should be the human and first and foremost uh, the Moscovite. There are challenges, sure. Now and then we have meetings with people, uh, Moscow citizens, first of all. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the, uh, 
a lot of problems. One of them are people who paid uh, uh, for their uh, flat uh, in a new uh, block uh, being constructed. So it was kind of primary investment. And uh, some of those people uh, didn't get their flats uh, and they uh, didn't get their money back. So they came to us. They asked us to help the city to uh, finish and to provide them with the apartments. I don't know uh, if there is a problem like this in uh, the city of Antwerp, but we have problems like this. You, and you know, I told uh, those people uh, that, yes, we'll help them. Sabanian has promised to do it. He will do it. But money will go from Moscow city budget. And it means that this money will get to these private apartments, uh, but will not get to some outpatients clinic, to some kindergarten construction. So I mean that p if people invet, invest privately, they need to be responsible for their money, for their homes, and for their health. Uh, they need to uh, be responsible taking decisions. Unfortunately, in this country, people are used to the fact that uh, the state will help everywhere. And this is one of the problems and challenges we face. Oh, thank you. I believe this is not the answer I expected. This is a good answer uh, because um, it focuses on the one unresolved problem in Moscow's social policy. And I would agree with Mr. Pechatnikov. It's uh, about the behavior of the residents because we intrinsically expect uh, that the state, the government, will take care of our social problems without understanding that if they finish our apartment, uh, they must use uh, uh, taxes. So people will uh, pay taxes, but they don't have money to finish uh, the apartment. So. Sadly, people don't understand uh, the ins and out, and I would uh, agree that uh, this is uh, a really critical program. That's this is our common agenda, not just the agenda of the power. Now, I would like to invite Lady Svetlana Chupsova, the general director in the agency of strategic uh, initiatives to continue uh, my comment on education and uh, recently we prepared we drafted a document for the president and we were looking at the city as a successful uh, example what do you believe what trends in development of the education system, including the uh, school education and extracurricular uh, education, what aspects uh, should be developed in uh, Moscow in this connection? Uh, thank you, Yaroslav. Dear colleagues, as we are at uh, Moscow, Urban Forum, you know, uh, Agency of Strategic uh, Initiatives focuses on projects uh, related to improving investment climate and creating favorable conditions for the business. And recent polling of Russian and international investors showed that today the key demand in order to 
implement a project, it's no longer about terms or procedures or markets, but we see that uh, the environment, the urban environment and the quality of life is more and more in demand. Investors and their families want uh, high quality education. They want uh, high quality urban infrastructure. And here Moscow is an undisputable leader. And we see how in recent eight years, urban environment and space dramatically changed. So uh, Leonid Mikhailovich covered uh, innovations and reforms in the area of education. And we don't only see it uh, as compared to other regions, but Moscow can compete to other countries and mega cities. Of our big, big world. And regarding education, trends and challenges we face, for every person it's really important not to just uh, get education, but to use skills and competences you receive all through your life uh, so that you uh, may become a specialist and get competences uh, to become somebody interesting and uh, to find a career that uh, would be able to ensure good quality of life to you and your family. And in recent years, we see the main demand from the employers and the main, uh, the main complaint from employers and investment is the quality of human resource preparation because it would appear that uh, the state uh, spends money on schools, on universities, on extracurricular activities. And uh, the uh, employee would say that the specialist is not ready, and then they have to spend extra money on retraining. So, and here, uh, I would like to say that a person faces a huge challenge not just to graduate from school, not just to get uh, a sort of uh, secondary education, but we must realize that we need to learn all through our life because some professions are dying, uh, economy changes. We are moving into the area of um, digitalizations and as uh, the uh, life expectancy is expected to grow, a person can change uh, a number of professions, a number of uh, occupations, and the city must create the infrastructure to gain these skills required for the future. Today, at school, we want to see like uh, a variety uh, meta subjects and uh, skills that would allow uh, a child to be a leader, to work uh, in a team, to carry out projects. Skills that would allow a kid to become a specialist and adapt quickly in the rapidly changing world and uh, to um, rapidly get uh, some new competencies. And Moscow is the best practice case in terms of what's been introduced in school. And so we can mention Moscow Electronic School with the entire platform for human resource training, uh, medical classes, when separately Moscow uh, takes the demand in the medical area and began the career or vocational orientation from the school years so that young people, when they graduate from school, uh, would get some actual skills for them to understand where they want to go, engineering classes. Today, we have built a system when parents and a child 
can, depending on the area of Moscow he lives, what's the demand for vacant jobs? What jobs are in demand? What potential employer can become your employer? And get an opportunity to get uh, extra education, extra training courses for professional uh, navigation, for traineeship or probations. And also, Moscow um, organized a very important uh, experiment when Mayor Sobyanin, together with uh, uh, Ros Obernadzor and Moscow universities, they tried to look that uh, what would happen if the graduates would be tested by employers. And I believe that uh, Mayor Sabanian said that just one per, uh, that the employers were happy with just uh, one percent of students which were ready uh, to be hired. And it's important that uh, today in Moscow and in regions we support uh, early professional gui guidance and informal education when a person from elementary school can try uh, what's interesting to him. Um, different online courses, different uh, forums like uh, Technoparks for Children, serious, a stunning um, place uh, which the president gave as a present to the young people, where you can try different professions and can select a potential career where you would like to become an expert, a good professional. So, of course, we can say a lot about inclusive education. And again, Moscow is a leader in terms of accessible environment and uh, inclusive education uh, programs follow up. So we had the first uh, technopark for children with extra opportunities for disabled uh, People, I believe it's uh, one of the best, uh, um, one one of the best uh, forums, and we also have technology studies. Um, the first lesson was uh, not uh, uh, delivered at schools, but at techno parks, where little kids were able to to know professors, professors from federal universities who told them about physics and chemistry uh, via meta subjects, via projects, and kids defended some ready projects which they can integrate and implement in our real life. So, practices Moscow approbated um, at home um, because Moscow Electronic School is open for uh, professors from other regions of the Russian Federation with a uh, curriculum and methodology available online uh, and teachers from other regions can use them. So in terms of comfort of life and living standards, and demand for high quality education and healthcare. Moscow is a leader. And without touching upon education issues, uh, Mr. Leonid uh, uh, Mikhailovich, I would like to thank you. And uh, also, a project uh, I would like to mention projects, uh, charity projects by. Uh, Vera Foundations and Konstantin uh, Habensky, who contacted President of the Russian Federation, so, and um, families of those who are facing challenging situation. So Moscow became the only region of the Russian Federation which approved uh, uh, a support program. Thank you so very much for what you do. Thank you, Svetlana. Now, I would like to ask uh, Oliver Bernat, so a partner in Price Waterhouse Coopers, to answer a question. Er earlier this year, Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, offered a research on the quality of uh, healthcare 
in, in the capital. So what was the result of the research? So in what direction uh, Moscow healthcare system should develop? Not, not uh, in terms of uh, uh, Russia, but uh, as compared to Europe. Uh, so uh, wealthy people in Russia love to go to Europe uh, for medical services. So do you think uh, we can um, uh, continue or do we, you think we can uh, reduce uh, the number of medical tourism? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to this topic. I will answer your question over the next six minutes. Uh, and in the six minutes, I have three objectives. One, to introduce the report to you that you just referred to. Uh, secondly, to tell you about what mind shift we have to make in how to provide and plan for healthcare. And thirdly, I hope that you invite me back so I can talk to you for a bit longer than six minutes. May I start with, as you mentioned, the... Okay, we will invite you to the Higher School of Economics. So based on the um, Shanghai 2016 uh, conference, we um, created a report that's now available online already under this link and uh, within a day or so there will also be an English version available. What the report has picked up is uh, five topics that came out of the Shanghai conference and the research was formed around these questions. In particular around health, not just isolated into what happens in hospitals, but also something that um, is involved in all policies. Uh, it has to involve social and environmental factors as the main determinants for ill health, um, as well as community engagement and the engagement of the people themselves, and I come back to that, uh, as well as um, equitable distribution of services, as well as, as access to uh, well-being and uh, healthcare de um, services. We based the research on uh, the categories that were recommended by the WHO, but translated them into specific factors. For interest of time, I won't go into them in great detail, but there are a dimension around the healthcare provision as such, so how many hospitals, doctors and the like one has, one around other factors like uh, obesity, smoking, um, exercise, um, air pollution and the right that these are non uh, hospital-based health factors, either behaviors or environmental, and then to come to the sort of outcome measures thereof. We selected 15 cities uh, through a methodology that I won't go in detail for the interest of time, but uh, trust me that we got to 15 representative uh, mega cities in the world in different regions and of different profiles, and ultimately came to, as I said, three dimensions, and here I only show the main uh, output together with three example uh, values, and there are several more, and this report has 60 pages of benchmarks, so I hope I whet your appetite to, to get those. And you see that the cities rank differently in terms of uh, the, the level of healthcare services that are provided, and I may just draw your attention on sort of examples between, on the one side, number of doctors or the number of nurse per doctor. There are some places that have a lot of doctors, but not many nurses per doctor, and you could argue that that might not be the most efficient way of delivering healthcare. Um, so I, I think, uh, so for example, in, in New York, there are 4.8 doctors, but over three nurses per doctor. In Moscow, you have relatively few nurses per doctor, maybe because the role of the nurse hasn't been fully developed and exploited into what a nurse can do. So that would be one of the suggestions that we would make. Another one is on other factors, and here are, for example, I put only up uh, pollution levels or uh, how many people exercise regularly or what's the distribution of public parks, and that uh, varies again very widely, and again I refer to the report for details, and only finally then the overall health of the citizen measured by life expectancy and uh, low birth weight infants. Now the whole thing gets summarized in a nice uh, graphic, where on the x-axis you see the the provision of healthcare as such on the y-axis, the uh, non-directly medical factors, and the size of the bubble is uh, the overall 
healthcare outcome in terms of mortality, uh, life expectancy. Now, I've plotted here Moscow as an example, and you see that uh, Moscow in 2012 to 17 had made significant improvements on both dimensions, and the bubble size got bigger, as you would expect. Now, some of you that are a bit mathematically inclined will notice that you would expect bubble size to always be bigger on the right upper corner, which is not necessarily the case, because there are many other factors that we do not include in here that would change life expectancy and the like, like migration and all the rest of it. But if you take an individual city and follow it as a trajectory, then you can see an increase in bubble size. So as I said, the first two minutes, um, that's what the report goes to in greater detail in these 15 cities, and you're welcome to download it from, from our website. What I wanted to then mention, so what's next? And as I said, in the next two minutes, I want to wake you up and ask for a rethinking of what healthcare actually does. I was very inspired yesterday by the um, presentation of your mayor uh, saying that um, the people should love Moscow, but Moscow should love them back. And that's, and oh, here was also mentioned about the human in the center of all this. Too often I still see healthcare being measured by the number of hip joint replacements performed or how many beds the hospitals in the city have. This is all very interesting and of course you need hip joint replacements and you need beds in hospitals. But you need to start thinking about from a person's and patient's perspective what does that do for me. For me it's important that I can walk without pain for more than 100 meters whether I need a hip joint replacement or something else is a secondary question. And if you flip that on its head and go from the value chain for the patient, services start looking different. It also means that the role of the patient is different. We all, or most of us, will already, will already, will already um, book your travel online. Many of us do banking online, but how many of us do book our outpatient appointments online? Not many. Um, so the whole attitude of people that you go to the hospital when you're sick and then you will be taken care of has to change. Thinking about your health has to be a daily occurrence, just checking your account balance or doing anything else, and you should be in, uh, empowered to do so. So empowering and activating the patient is as important as reshaping the services around the patient. That's the most important point of what I say. So if everything else you don't remember, that's, do remember that. Now, I just want to highlight five trends that we have identified again as part of the research. The first, in successful healthcare systems that where cost per patient comes down but uh, outcomes improve, we see the patient centricity, which I've just mentioned. Another one is a shift from cure, curing people to preventing disease. At Kaiser, where I worked as a doctor in America for many years, uh, this, our slogan was better care is cheaper. So if you look after patients well in the preventive side, you avoid lots of cost and illness obviously downstream. And again, uh, typically the focus and investment goes into treating complicated disease and, and advanced disease rather than early stage. Digitalization. The, one of the biggest challenges in many places where I work, and that is in London as well as in Saudi Arabia or other places, there is not enough Sorry, I can't speak directly to the microphone. Uh, there's not enough workforce available to actually cover all services. Thereby, activating patients will require tools for them to interact with the system, and digital tools obviously are perfect for that purpose. Data centricity, you need to have data in order to measure what you're doing. Uh, that goes without saying. However, there's a lot of investment and improvement to be done on the data capture and, and, and using it for planning your care. And finally, value-driven care. As I mentioned earlier, better care is typically cheaper. You also need to see what activities you invest in, and that is public health, but also treatments. I often come to cities where they have a long list of public health initiatives. They're all wonderful, and they all came up because somebody mentioned at a conference that's a great idea here and it's a great idea there, and maybe somebody's personal hobby. But when you all stack them up, you don't really know whether each one of the interventions fits together and whether that is best value for money. You can develop something like a cost curve where you rank all interventions by how many quality life use you can buy for how much money and thereby have a more strategic approach which initiatives do you actually want to run with a given certain budget size. That also means that many of them that might sound like a good idea you will not do because they're not cost effective. 
So all of these need to be put together into a future plan, but the most important one is to really start very radically thinking about services that we provide from the patient's perspective and to redefine the role of the patient themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Nyuta Federmesser, uh, uh, chairperson of uh, uh, Hospice uh, Foundation, Vera. Uh, could you please share with us how palliative care in Moscow is structured now? Uh, well, unfortunately, and I'm sorry, I don't know so much about it. It's a new trend, uh, and a big part of it is taken by volunteers. Do you agree that this is the way this kind of care should develop? Or do you think that we need uh, to expect more from the authorities? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, it, w it would not be me if I had said Everything is okay. Now, certainly we need more, would like to have more uh, impact and more help. But what we have today is a great uh, breakthrough. And it happened due to collaboration with the city, due to its being transparent to non-commercial organizations and foundations. This is the only sphere in the social life of the city and of the country, which uh, has done such a breakthrough. We have a 100% collaboration of the foundation and the city and the national structure and the institution. So this collaboration uh, helped us to improve the health uh, and the quality and quantity. Let me go back to what uh, uh, mayor of uh, Antwerp said. Uh, he said that the city uh, should be comfortable for everyone, uh, to citizens, visitors, uh, people with disabilities, uh, people with some uh, special needs. And you also said that uh, we love uh, Moscow, and mayor loves Moscow, uh, and uh, Moscow should love us back. What I mean, the city is a family. Things happen in family. Everything happens. Uh, we have uh, kids, uh, or some people die. Uh, we give birth to healthy kids. We give birth to kids with uh, some special needs. and But everyone uh, needs his or her love. Everyone should have uh, his or her part of love. Everyone should be happy. Everyone in the family should have their special holidays. And they need to have traditions. Uh, for many years, uh, palliative care existed in Moscow, but hasn't been developing. It's normal. If we compare what we have today here in Moscow uh, with what they have in other countries, in developed countries, uh, it started the same way. Actually, uh, their social programs for uh, palliative care started the same time when special programs for uh, senior people emerged. We are a bit ahead. They are ahead and we are behind, but we are moving forward. Let me underline, all of us, Moscow citizens, once started to go abroad after the epoch of the Soviet Union, and we got surprised uh, seeing uh, that uh, there are some services other countries have and we don't. And then we wanted to have the same kind of programs for us. Uh, then uh, 
we started to combat with this kind of problems and challenges. But we can see that still people with uh, special needs, people with disabilities need some particular programs. So Moscow today is among tops. We have a uh, long time programs for people uh, who require health, people with disabilities. Uh, President Putin, uh, Sergei Sabanyan, all the tops, uh, they do not close their eyes. They see those problems. And they know that about 60,000 people uh, need palliative care, and only about 20,000 really get this kind of adequate palliative care. Uh, so they have heard this, pro this problem. They have noticed it. And I would like to thank our government, our officials, for that. Thanks to them, my family will have uh, effort, power, and even money to help the, the, all these people. Maybe some people from this room will need palliative care somehow. Well, a lot of people uh, who are afraid uh, of palliative care, of the word narcotic drugs, of painkillers, that is why I've brought some slides for you. I just want to share with you that today in Moscow, like in Antwerp, like in other European cities, you can get them. Uh, you can get help. Uh, you can f have no pain. Uh, you can get human help. Not enough so far. But I'm not 70. Still, I have time. Uh, and I think that we have time and effort to improve it further. Thank you very much, Nyota. So you wanted to take the main part of the seven minutes of my presentation. It is not all. So you can see this is a hospice, and this is how people uh, watch uh, uh, FIFA 2018. This is another Moscow hospice. Uh, this is uh, how our patients uh, take walks. So hospice is about life. Uh, for Moscow, it is unique, and you can, well, for the world not, and on the right-hand side, uh, on the wheelchair, you can see a, a lady uh, with the uh, artificial lung ventilation device, and her neighbor helps her to, to hold it. Until last year, we didn't have people with this kind of devices. Uh, there were some people, uh, but only in inpatient departments. Now, uh, there are a lot of people like this. Uh, Svetlana, the patient, uh, asked me to thank you, Leonid, for this program. And this is one more thing. Uh, I hope that we will allow uh, children, grandparents, uh, to go to hospice and to, uh, to see their grandpas and grannies. These are my volunteers, and they're responsible for ceramic workshop. Uh, this is what we call labor therapy, but I would prefer to use the word life. This is normal life. Uh, this lady um, is, uh, is now staying at a palliative care center, but she likes cooking, and she cooks all the time. Uh, some people with dementia also can cook. Uh, I've uh, learned that uh, uh, there are elderly ladies uh, with dementia, but who can cut onions, and they do it in a fantastic way. Um, well, we, our palliative care center uh, hasn't been uh, under renovation yet, but th this is how we uh, made the decoration of the walls together with our volunteers. Uh, well, but we allow pets uh, to 
to go into the palliative care center so they can have horse therapy or dog therapy or whatever. This is how we celebrated the birthday of one of our patients. We uh, have friends. Uh, these are the cleaners from uh, Tajikistan. So we work together with that company. And the cleaners, uh, they cooked plov, the national dish of Tajikistan there. Art therapy we widely used. And this is a unique Moscow uh, project, a uh, home hospice, Domsmaikum. Uh, so this is the project of Dom Smekom, uh, Foundation Vera, Foundation Padari Zizn, uh, and the Moscow city government. And in Moscow, we'll have the first hospice for kids. Uh, maybe uh, I should feel ashamed because there are uh, hospices for kids in other countries. For us, it's only the first hospice. but. Uh, it will uh, be launched uh, better late than never. Um, and this guy will be one of uh, its patients. This uh, uh, is how we danced uh, in the street, in the yard of our palliative center. And this is how we celebrated the birthday of one of our patients. And uh, I uh, danced with him. Once uh, he was a bit shy, but then he admitted that uh, he hadn't danced for a long time. And he liked it. Kole Mitsielski is a great patient. He suffers from AIDS. Uh, and thanks to him, uh, we got to understand that uh, hospice uh, should be open also admitting HIV-infected people. It is quite new for this country. We'll like them. There is no stigma. Kolya was the first uh, patient because uh, he uh, was an active person just fighting for the rights of HIV-infected uh, people. So this is a concert. Uh, this is how we did picnicking. We had a barbecue, but we didn't cook barbecue ourselves, but uh, a Moscow restaurant without money uh, cooked barbecue for us and shashlik as well. This is about all I wanted to share with you. Uh, but I would like to emphasize that Moscow is a family which is ready to love everyone, to love all people, people with special needs too. Uh, some uh, time ago, it had been done like this. Leonid, uh, thank you very much. I wish you more uh, power. And just uh, thank you very much for what you have done and for what you are doing. Thank you very much, Nyota. I would like to cover one more aspect of this topic. We didn't like it some time ago. Savien Manuet, uh, Sima Social, the founders of Sima Social, which is a unique international organization for emergency medical, social, um, and uh, medical help uh, to uh, people uh, who are homeless. So, Xavier, uh, can you always have uh, good uh, dialogue with the city local authorities. Uh, so uh, what is the situation, how you collaborate uh, with the local government now? Yes, uh, today we are in Moscow. But uh, and we emphasize Moscow. Uh, but we can uh, discuss other cities. A friend of mine is a doctor, a legend doctor, Professor Rochelle. You know him very well. 
I saw him in this room, but he has disappeared somehow. He is also very active uh, in this sphere. When you have this kind of people as part of your team, then we can start the dialogue with the authorities, local authorities, city authorities. But some of them are quite tough. Uh, speaking about Moscow, we managed uh, to uh, start speaking the same language with Mr. Petuhov and other Moscow city authorities. Uh, we agreed from the very beginning that we have the same vision uh, to the situation. Uh, they will not get to us, but uh, we should get and get to them and suggest and, uh, doing something and offer help. And we did that. And I would like to help uh, the uh, Moscow city authorities for collaboration. Uh, so I, well, we, uh, I would like to thank uh, representatives of the CR. Uh, and let me show some pictures to you then. So by 2015, three thirds or three fourths of people will live in cities or close to them. But at the same time, we see a certain loss of spiritual symbols. When people move uh, to cities, they lose elements of traditional peasantry culture, some anchors. They used to have uh, some traditions, uh, customs. They don't live the way their grandfathers and grand great-grandfathers lived. So we are based on laws, not on customs. And laws can change. That's why in a new urban society you have a continuous discussion. Traditions are something conservative and today we mainly talk about innovation so we are talking about science and technology and people behave differently when people move to the city mentally they stay um, at their village they start to use social media but uh, Yes, a situation which I try to represent is a Russian nested uh, dolls. The first doll is like poor working people. The second are senior people. The third doll is migrants. Uh, a doll a little bit uh, smaller, which are people, homeless people, and then people without uh, uh, th that own a house but uh, live uh, on the street. So you see a number of social options hiding be behind uh, this uncertainty. So as uh, our today's moderator said, if uh, um, unemployment is uh, falling down, then there is a dynamic uh, in the society. Uh, as Jean Foucault said, you need four fundamental principles. Uh, perception of the body and the body of, of uh, your own body and of others, uh, perceptions of uh, time, uh, perception of space, the way we occupy the space, and perception of social code, social rules. So when people come to the city, they would change uh, all the four perceptions. Please, have a look how time is perceived in traditional rural communities 
term used to be seen as something cyclical because it's a society of peasants. They live in a rhythm of uh, a seeding, harvesting the crops. So it's a circular structure. And we in the city, we live in a linear mode. We cannot uh, memorize and reproduce the past like peasants. So we live in linear. So we are more focused on uh, today's moment. So we are in a strange situation, in a situation of continuous mobility. You need to adapt to the current uh, moment, especially for those who are newcomers mm, to the cities. For instance, in France, migrants from Algeria have different social demands and social vision, especially for those who recently moved, or also perception of the body. The body remembers how your mother cherished you, how she looked at you. And at the same time, there are people which uh, didn't go ten tenderness from the papers, but uh, which were raped and abused. And no matter how you try to erase it from your memory, the perception remains in place. What is time? Time is a continuing present. So for senior people, quite often they lose their memory to such extent that they lose the feeling of time and at an early stage of dimension. People, uh, a psychiatrist would say, uh, so we had an appointment, but they, the patient didn't come, so they probably forgot. No, but uh, they forgot that the time flies by. So also the perception of space like intimate space or private space, in different councils, in different social uh, groups. Uh, so touching the body of others is perceived very, very different. So in some societies, it seems as something normal. But in others, like, uh, like a punch, then uh, the perceptions of the other. Do we know the other? person we are talking to. And there are very different uh, types of social exclusion, aggression, depression, mental fixation, and abandoning. Quite often, people in the street can stop in the street and can spend like 45 minutes talking to the others. But in other societies, it would not be normal. But however, they all live together. Now, I would like to show you some pictures, some photographs. They are hard to see. It. So these scenes were shot in Moscow, in Tunisia, whatever, in every city of the world. So we prepared a series of photos. We will show if we have time. If it's possible, I would like to show you some pictures. So quite hard to see it. Uh, apart from uh, physical lesions, people don't perceive their body. They don't perceive it's a completely different mentality. And I am uh, a doctor by profession, and I am a doctor politician. And uh, the doctor who works in the field automatically becomes uh, a politician. Many politicians, many responsible people, even if they have a medical uh, education, they just don't want to see mm, pictures like this, but we must remember. So a uh, diabetic uh, lesion of the limb. Yeah, have a look uh, at the effect of, uh, of some diseases. So there was uh, like uh, you know, plaster, uh, 
And you see, so it uh, became part of so part of the thumb. So they forgot to replace the gypsus, and it led to a necrosis of uh, the tissues. And for instance, in winter, somebody um, fell asleep uh, in the street, uh, uh, being been drunk, and this is the secondary stage of uh, uh, syphilis. Our doctors uh, learned about that uh, at uh, the medical school, but actually they cannot receive it. They don't think that uh, it's possible to have that type of skin diseases or, yes, uh, some painful things. Uh, people don't imagine they can have a disease like this. So for doctors, they need to go down to social layers where it's still possible. So in our work, mobility is um, critical to take a person to a refuge, to take him away from this street environment. Uh, for that, you need special, uh, yes, and also the number of people like this is very high. Once we fill the refuge up with people, once we approach a person, we see a person in a grave state, we try to look in his eyes, we try to talk to him and to diagnose what's going on, and then we, this is our work in Paris and in Senegal, uh, these uh, children living in the streets in Senegal. So we have that type of uh, cars, uh, mobile crews for rescue for intensive care. And I need to know, I would like to tell you that actually in Moscow work is carried out following patterns we developed. And we need to understand that the uh, City Hall of Moscow supports us, and you need to uh, combine medical and social psychological approach. Patience on top of all. Thank you. And finally, I would like to give the last word to Miguel Marcarans representative of business, uh, VTB Bank. So what social pro projects are covered by the bank at the moment in Moscow? And I know that development of the social infrastructure is interesting for you as a commercial bank. Thank you. From 2014, we are partner of the forum. And it's not for nothing. It's not. Um, Accidentally, because we are part of the C team, and it's a lot has been said about what uh, the government of Moscow does, uh, the city hall, the mayor, but also I would like to highlight that not the city alone, but also organizing structures in the city must be part of these processes, and we have examples when we implement project together, and I would like to mention some of them. So social, card, social smart card for a Moscowite, which works for many years. And this is a joint partnership for the bank. So we are participating in a social project together with the city. Another important functioning project and also covering the term social taxi, a service and social services for um, people with low mobility, and also the possibility to use a Moscowite smart card in the cars uh, allows us to help people. A lot has been done. And as for me, as a Moscowite, I feel it uh, on my own example. So we talked about uh, the World Cup. I was to the World Cup games, and I saw people with disabilities, how they participated how they attended uh, stadiums, and it became possible 
there were electric cars uh, moving people around and it was possible to use the Moscow Central Circle. Uh, you could use the lift. Uh, it was unimaginable that it uh, was possible. As for me, I used that uh, type of the vehicles and my mother was with me and she could use the lift because it was not convenient for her to um, go down the stairs. And uh, okay, trying to look around, now, there are no areas in Moscow where we would not see implementation of this plan of city to make Moscow comfortable for all those people who live in Moscow and they're also the guests of the city. Okay, uh, parking lots for bikes. If you will check the rates, well, yes, uh, a project uh, our bank was equally involved in. It's not a business project, it's a social project. Uh, the number of bicycle users is growing. And I would like to tell you what's the attitude of the bank to all initiatives uh, of the city. In every branch uh, of our bank, in every office, uh, we provide for the opportunity to access uh, the bank's uh, system. And this is also the case with uh, people with disabilities. Our ATM have special keys which allow people with impaired vision to use this device and it applies to everything we do. A lot has been said on what should be done, but we made uh, a good progress and we continue to participate in all initiatives and we support them as we are part of this environment. And we, are, we uh, would fully like our city to be as comfortable as possible in all regards. So, and also, I'm a frequent traveler abroad I have the chance to see capitals. And uh, earlier, I was really surprised and impressed uh, by how clean streets and the parks were. But now, getting back to Moscow, I realize that now Moscow is not inferior to any major city of the world. Yeah, of course you have better examples, but at least uh, we feel comfortable here. Uh, myself as uh, a resident of Moscow, and as a big corporation, we are a big federal bank, we try to follow all the trends, all the trends in all their manifestations, in all our business environment. Uh, no matter whether we use digital channels or physical contacts with our clients, we try to take into account the social factor. And uh, as an example, I can tell you that we still um, Eighty-five percent of our payments for utility services in Moscow uh, or state uh, duties and taxes uh, are offered to our customers uh, for free. So, in the multi-purpose, uh, in every multi-purpose uh, center, and I don't know where it's in the world it's organized better. Uh, one window, so it's a place where you have uh, like free internet, free toilet. You can log on the website for free because you need uh, consultation. So you have uh, like a self-service device, ATMs, where you can mm, pay, make all payments for free. And this is our social position together with the city, which allows us to create comfortable environment and resolve questions uh, we have uh, on the agenda. I'm through, thank you. Thank you. So today uh, we had a very exciting panel and all presentations show that today Moscow uh, became an incubator of uh, the best social development practices. We are not uh, at the starting point, but at the very beginning of our path for developing the social area. Uh, every one of us uh, would consider as uh, being compliant with our expectations for how it should be. It's important that uh, we started to realize social area 
is not only some nice things. If we have a good and developed social area, which could become an important argument for living in Moscow, when we start turning a blind eye on social problems, and I would like to thank Nuta and Xavier for reminding us of those things. Without that, no social policy is nothing more as like a hallmark case. So, but we uh, made this step in Moscow, and probably this is a sort of breakthrough point in moving to a decent social policy uh, which is in line with the interest of common people. Okay, so Mr. Leonid, uh, the last word is yours. I would like to thank all the speakers and especially Yaroslav for being a great moderator. Um, it's been most interesting for me to listen to your feedback and your assessment. Uh, clear enough, uh, uh, nothing can be just ideal. Let me bring about two facts. Last year, last summer especially, uh, uh, there was the working group from the, uh, the World Health Association next to London. Mr. Gusseni was, and they admitted uh, Moscow as uh, uh, the world leader for uh, life expectancy improvement. So we haven't reached uh, the level of life expectancy of Europe, but we develop rapidly and we improve every half a year. And this is a great speed. I hope we'll uh, still have it. One more thing. Last Tuesday, uh, the chief doctor of FIFA came to me for a visit. He's the citizen of the South African Republic, and for 20 years he's been the chief medical expert of FIFA. He wanted to see me before leaving. He wanted to tell me that he had been to 75 world countries, and he was responsible for uh, medical care during FIFA. And he was uh, absolutely sincere to admit that uh, the level of medical care in Moscow uh, was great and incomparable. Uh, so he, uh, he saw that uh, no one of the um, Moscow uh, inpatient department, uh, we uh, performed shunting, coronary shunting, and that was great. He said he hadn't seen anything which could be compared to Moscow in neither of the 75 countries. My colleagues uh, who uh, started uh, the reform and uh, who have done and uh, who have gone with me through all the steps. Not all the steps were popular among citizens. But today uh, we can see that we uh, have done it uh, the right way. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you for good assessment. And I would like to thank all of you uh, to be present here. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. I would like to thank Yaroslav uh, for, uh, for such a great assessment. Thank you, dear colleagues.